أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and uh, welcome to another one of our Mizan live sessions I hope uh, everyone is doing well and I hope this uh, past week of uh, Ramadan this past uh, seven almost eight days of Ramadan that's passed by. Hopefully it's been a good Ramadan uh, for you guys so far. And hopefully it's been a Ramadan that we've been able uh, to grow uh, in. So as you know, we were discussing the tafsir of Surah Yasin. We will be continuing with that. Uh, in our previous session, we went all the way up to verse number 12. And as I normally do, I'm going to do a quick uh, recap of verses 6 to 12. And then we'll move on to verse number 12 onwards, which has to do with that famous story that's mentioned in Surah Yasin. I mean, it's a story that I've personally read more, you know, multiple times we've, because we read Surah Yasin so often. But a lot of times we don't know exactly what happened um, in that story. In fact, one of the brothers was asking me about this story right before uh, Ramadan, a couple weeks before Ramadan. I told him that in Ramadan we're going to be discussing this these three uh, prophets and who they were, what was their message, and what we can learn from their story, inshallah. So, quick recap of verses 6 to uh, 12. Verse 6, six said, لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنْذِرَ أَبَاؤُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ We are sending you to a group of people, and these people, their fathers, have never been uh, basically warned. No indhar has been done for them, in the sense that the message has not been sent to them and we had a discussion here does it mean that no message has been sent to them does it mean that a message is out there it's somewhat hidden um, as the ahadith say there are periods of time where the messages of certain prophets were somewhat somewhat hidden when i say hidden either it was just time and history that hid them or there were people who actively wanted to hide the message of these prophets right so this is what the Quran says, we are sending you, their father, they are oblivious, they are ghafil because of this. Then we moved on from that to verse number 7. These people that you're going to go to speak to, most of them, the deal is already done with them. Because they have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much at this point that the decree of your Lord has been established for them. That means... That at this point, there's no turning around for them. Not that God will not allow them to turn around. They just won't do it. Why? Because God has stamped their hearts at this point. This is something that is quite scary. If someone reaches that point where God stamps his heart, or as the Quran says, When you put a stamp on something, it means that it's the end, right? Um, and, and, and when you stamp something, that means there's nothing else is going to happen with this letter, right? Um, the Quran says this happens to them. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Therefore, they won't believe. We moved on from that. We said that the Quran describes these people like this. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ We have put chains and shackles on their necks. And these shackles go all the way up to their chin and therefore it holds their chin up. In other words, the Quran is saying that these guys are looking up at the sky. They don't see the path on which they are walking. They're lost, right? And in front of them and behind them, we have placed barriers. These barriers have covered them from every direction. They don't have insights. They don't know what they're doing. We said that there's a discussion here. Is this talking about this world? Is it talking about the next world? Which one of these is it talking about? We said that it actually can refer to this world and the next world. Because again, in Surah Ibrahim, verse 32, uh, 42, we read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, These people, their heads are up. And this is description of Yawmul Qiyamah. And this completely makes sense because whatever you do in this world is going to manifest itself to a much fuller extent, to a much further extent in the next world. Therefore, this is for them in both of these worlds, right? We moved on from that. Regardless of whether you warn these people or you don't warn these people, 
لا يؤمنون they're not going to believe in what you have to say إنما تنذر من اتبع الذكر only those who follow the Quran they will be they will benefit from this in that and this warning of yours وخش وخشي الرحمن بالغيب and those who are fearful of Allah سبحانه وتعالى when others are not around so what happens to them فبشره بمغفرة وأجر كريم for them you tell them that there's going to be maghfira for them and there's going to be ajrin karimin. Now, I'm going to make a quick point here before we move on. That in the Quran, the tanween that you find on many of the words in the Quran, it can have different meanings, right? Sometimes there's a tanween, it's called tanween of tafkhim. Tafkhim means when you want to glorify something or rather to show that something is really big, it's really significant, right? This is tafkhim. Sometimes when you want to explain that something was great, right? You'd use a word that is nakara in the sense that you say, I'll give you an example, for example. You say, hey, brother, I went to an iftar. What an iftar it was, right? You don't specify what type of iftar it was. You don't explain about it. You just say it was such, it, what an iftar was it? This tanween that we have in, after some of the words of the Quran, they are there to explain that this Ajr in the in this case is such a great ajr, right? This is how the Quran speaks about it. So tell them that there is going to be this great and honorable ajr for them. Right? And it doesn't specify, and that's part of explaining how great this uh, ajr is going to be for them. Inna nahnu nuhyil mauta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum wa kulla shayin ahsaynahu fi imamin mubin. We write down everything that these guys are doing. We are the ones who bring people back to life. So these guys will have to answer for what they have done. And we write down everything that they have sent forward. And the things and the effects of the things that they have done. We explained that the things they have sent forward are the things that they do in this world. And the result of it shows up in this world. In other words, they are sending it ahead. Refers to those actions that they do in this world. But the results of it start to show up after they have left this world. This is atharahum. Wa kulla shayin ahsaynahu fi imamin mubin. And everything we have been taking account of it fi imamin mubin. We have been taking account of everything in a clear imam. Salam alaikum to everybody who's joined us, by the way. Um, we explained that fi Imam al Mubin, according to the Mufassirin, refers to Lawh al Mahfuz. Lawh al Mahfuz, of course, is that book that contains everything, not just our actions. No, it contains everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen also in the future. Okay. And we had a discussion why is it that the Quran refers to this book as Imam al Mubin? Okay. Mufassirin say because this book actually leads to other books because that's what Imam means literally the word Imam means to lead that's why we say when someone is leading Jamaat we call them the Imam because others do it Imam to him they uh, basically follow him right so this book is a leader of two other books what other two books are these that this book is leading right this takes a little bit of explanation and I explained it last week I'm just doing it very quickly there are two other books that the Quran also speaks about, right? And this happens, brothers and sisters, when you start to make connection with different verses of the Quran, the Quran starts to, you start to understand things a whole lot better now, right? There is one book that is the uh, book of our deeds on a personal level. That's, this is that same book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for some people will give it to their right hand, for some people they, we give it to shimalihi, we give it to his left hand, right? So that's one book. Another book we have that the Quran talks about is the book of nations. What's in this book of the nations? It's the actions of those nations as a whole. When a nation did something as a whole, when they took part in things as a whole, those actions are written down in that book, right? Uh, on that day, every nation is going to be called based on their books or towards their books, right? So there are two other books other than this Lawh Mahfud. The reason why this Lawh Mahfud is leading these two other books is this, because in other verses of the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "We have been telling our angels 
to copy Lohe Mahfuz into these two other books. Huh? We have been copying. It doesn't say we've been writing, right? Although it's writing as well. But it says we have been copying. Why? Because these are copied, these two other books, which we are mostly familiar with. These two other books are copied from this book of, this book that we know of as Lohe Mahfuz. All right. I don't know if uh, we're frozen or not. I think we're back, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, good. We're back. So there are three books that the Quran talks about, and this is why this book is called Imam, because it leads those two other books. Okay, moving on from that. Uh, we also had hadith here, and I'm going to explain this last week, but I'll move on from it, that we also have hadith here that this Imam in Mubin refers to Ali ibn Abi Talib, refers to the first Imam. We explained that this does not negate the apparent meaning of this verse. It does not mean that وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْسَيْنَهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ it doesn't mean that it does not refer to Lawha Mahfuz. No, at a deeper level, it might also refer to the first Imam, why? Because he also has access to this Lawha Mahfud as we know it. Okay, so these two understandings, they do not contradict one another. And this is something that we have in multiple verses of the Quran, where a certain Imam is basically inserted into the meaning of a certain verse. Like Hadith says that this verse is referring to this Imam, for example, right? Particularly, we have this a lot with uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi so we said that these two meanings they do not negate one another and that's very important to remember so when we come across ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqim and hadith says as-sirat al-mustaqim is ali ibn abi talib this is an example of as-sirat al-mustaqim it doesn't mean that the quran was supposed to be revealed ihdina ali ibn abi talib or ali ibn abi talib for example that's not what uh, the verse is saying okay this is where we reached last session moving on to verse 12 and onwards or i should say verse 13 and onwards this part of the surah starts to explain about a story and this story like i mentioned at the beginning of today's session is a story that many of us might have heard about before but there's quite a bit of details that we um, don't know about the story partially because the quran doesn't go into too much detail so let's go through it Let's see how much detail we can get from hadith, how much we can get from history to have a better understanding of this uh, story. And also, um, what can we learn in terms of the lessons, which is obviously the most important thing. So, verse 13 starts out like this. Give them the mathal. Tell them about this group of people. Ashabul qarya, the people of the city or the village. Qarya can mean both. When the Mursaloon came to them. Okay, so who were these people? There's discussion and debate amongst Mufassirin. Some say that these Mursaloon, these messengers, were messengers of Isa salam, in the sense that they were representatives of Isa salam, that were sent by Isa, like they were a Muballigh, for example, on behalf of Isa salam. Some people say no. And this is, in fact, the more prevalent opinion. Some say, no, these guys were prophets themselves. Okay. Where was this Qarya? Again, history tells us that it was probably in Antioch. Antioch is nowadays in southeastern uh, Turkey, basically. Right. So these people are sent, these messengers are sent. How many were there? The next verse says this, We sent two of these messengers. These guys rejected, the people rejected the message of these two messengers. We didn't stop there. We added an extra messenger. We put a third one in there. So they continue to say, we are definitely messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you guys. First question that I need to answer here or, or need to bring up here is this. Why is it that when it comes to other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending two and three different messengers. But when it comes to us, uh, we get one messenger, for example, or not just us, other schools of uh, not other schools of thought, but the ummas of other prophets, right? How come they get one? How does this happen? What's the calculation that happens 
in the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or forgive me, not the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but how, how does he decide these things basically? What's the wisdom behind all of this, right? That for us, there's only one prophet, for example, but for these individuals, it seems as though that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending multiple prophets, right? How does that work? Um, and this is something that relates to our lives very often because a lot of people are of the type that they would say, hey, if God were to send me very clear signs about religion, about his existence and that kind of stuff, I would have believed in him. If I was going to receive three different messages, uh, basically, if I was going to receive uh, three different prophets are going to have three different prophets sent to me, I would believe, right? So to answer this question, brothers and sisters, as you look at the history of mankind, the more you come closer to today's day and age, you find that the intellect of the human being continues to grow and grow and grow. As the intellect of the human being continues to grow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has started to put more emphasis on intellectual arguments for his existence as opposed to the uh, you know the physical um, arguments for his existence okay so this is also something you find the differences between our prophet and prophet Musa for example when prophet Musa came the Quran says we gave him tis'a ayat and we gave him nine signs right other verses of the Quran says, Sal Bani Israel kam min ayatin bayina. Go ask Bani Israel how many signs we gave them. <laughs> we gave them so many, right? So for them, there were so many signs. Why? Because the intellect of the human being still has not matured. When you're dealing with a child, you need to do things a little more. You have to make more of an effort. You have to make things a whole lot more obvious, right? But when it comes to a human being that is now maturing from an intellectual perspective, now you can talk about more intellectual stuff. And that is why the Quran is a miracle for our day and age and for the rest of our times, the rest of time until Yawmul Qiyamah. But for previous prophets, their books, although their books might have also been miracles, but they were also accompanied throughout the life of that prophet by multiple miracles as well. Right. And our prophet obviously had miracles as well. But you will see even in history, there was less emphasis on those miracles compared to when it came to the Quran itself. We believe that the biggest proof for the prophethood of the prophet is what is the fact that the Quran is out there. Right. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for some people, he is going to send you know, 10, you know, multiple prophets. For some people, maybe for us, no, you might have one prophet. Why? Because the intellect of the human being has grown to a point now where you don't need three prophets. Back in the day, people looked at numbers. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to send people in numbers. Nowadays, that's not how people look at things anymore, right? The more mature you are, the less you look at numbers, the more you look at the content, the message, that is being delivered to you, does it make sense? Does it not make sense? That's why we have converts or reverts, right? If you look at the people who are involved in their life in terms of numbers of people who were pushing them towards Islam, it might be one, two, maybe even zero at times, right? But they embrace Islam, why? Because of the message. And hopefully, even if you're born into a Muslim family, that's the reason why hopefully you and I believe in Islam. It's because of the message. So this is one major, major difference you find in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drew past nations to towards the proper religion of their time and how he does this uh, today. And of course, this is a longer discussion, but we want to move on. Okay, so he sent the second one. They rejected him and then they, he sent a third one. What was their rejection? This is verse 15. They said, you're just human beings like us. You're nothing special. And Ar-Rahman in other words, God, he has not sent down anything. You guys are making all of this up. You guys are liars. Again, there's a little bit of a discussion here. This because God is quoting those people. Did they actually say, Ar-Rahman did not send anything down? Or is this God changing the wording while he's quoting what, what they were saying? There's a discussion here. Some say it's it's one, some say it's the other. Different opinions here. It doesn't make too much of a big difference. 
uh, in terms of uh, the meaning of the uh, the verse. Those who say that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changing the wording from saying Wama anzal Allah, for example, to Wama anzal Rahman, he's trying to say, look, these people who are rejecting their uh, my, my my message, they are rejecting the message of Ar Rahman. They're rejecting the message of the merciful one, right? The one who gave them all these blessings, now they're rejecting his message. Some say it's because of that. Moving on. Verse 16. قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ They said, these are the messengers, our Lord knows that we have been sent to you. Right? That we are definitely messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. Now, this part of it, you have to tap into a hadith. Why? Because we know that when prophets show up, they don't show up and just say, listen, you you guys should know that our Lord knows we're messengers. Well, that's not proof, right? That's why Hadith says that these people were performing miracles similar to the miracles of Isa alayhi salam, right? They were curing the blind. They were curing people with leprosy. And because of that, that's why they were saying that you guys know or our Lord knows that we have been sent. So the proof they had uh, uh, basically presented their proof uh, in other places. It's not that they just stood there and said that our Lord knows that we're messengers. No prophet um, comes with that type of a uh, approach, right? No, they come with proof. Either it's physical proof in the sense of a miracle or it's intellectual proof in the sense of arguments that they have. It's interesting. In the story of Prophet Musa, you find both of these actually, right? We know Prophet Musa is the one who brought his staff and, you know, threw his staff, the staff turned into the snake and ate all the other snakes and all of that, of course, is true. But it's interesting, when you look into the verses of the Qur'an, he actually makes arguments, intellectual arguments, before he starts throwing his staff. The whole staff throwing thing and uh, putting his hand into his clothes and his hand showing up uh, full of light and things of that nature, that was all after Fir'aun gathered his, uh, you know, his magicians and wanted to challenge him at that point, right? Um, initially, he starts speaking about arguments, right? And I can't remember the exact verses right now, but he says, Rabbu samawati wal I can't remember the verses right now, so I won't quote the verses right now. But anyways, moving on. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ There is nothing on us. We're not in charge or responsible for anything except delivering God's message. قالوا, this is a key verse here. إِنَّا بكم, We have tiara. We see you guys as a means of bad luck. لَإِن لَمْ تَنْتَهُوا لَنَرْجُمَنَّكُمْ وَلَيَمَسَّنَّكُمْ مِنَّا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ If you guys don't stop, we're going to reach a point where we are going to have to stone you guys to death. وَلَيَمَسَّنَّكُمْ مِنَّا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And a very painful punishment will come your way from us. Okay, what is this tatayarna? So, tatayarna means when you see something as a means of bad luck. This is mentioned here. It's also mentioned with regards to Prophet Musa. Uh, Musa wa man ma'a. That the people of Fir'aun used to say Musa is bad luck. Musa and his group, they're a means of bad luck. Why is it called this? You know, in Arabic, uh, a bird is called ta'ir or ta'irah. Right, something that flies. Right, they also use it for uh, airplanes as well nowadays in contemporary Arabic. So, why? What does this have to do with bad luck? So, back in the day, during the time of Jahiliyyah, people used to see certain things as uh, a sign of bad luck. Right, in particular, was the idea of seeing a crow uh, if it was making noise. Number one. Number two was if they saw a bird fly, like if a bird was sitting somewhere and it started to fly from the left side of a person, they would consider all of this bad luck. And this is why in Islamic culture or theology, I should say, this is referred to as a tiyara, right? Which comes from the root word of flying. Okay. Islam came into the picture and really attacked this whole thing because Islam had a major issue with this approach. That you sit there and you say, uh, I saw a bird flying or this kind of thing happening. And therefore, uh, today is going to be a bad day. Today there's bad luck. Okay. 
So what you find in the Sira, and this is something I want to talk about because this, uh, you know, it affects our day-to-day -day lives today as well. When you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Imams, you find that one of the things they used to do is that they used to take things that seemingly or supposedly seemed to be th things that are meaningless. They would in fact take those things and they would see them as signs of good luck. Okay, now when I say they used to see it as signs of good luck, you will forgive that wording a little bit because luck has a connotation to it. And the connotation is that things don't really have a cause and effect type of relationship and that God's not in the picture necessarily. So you guys know that that's not what we're referring to here, right? But they used to say things were signs of good luck in the sense that, like, for example, life was going to be easy. They assumed or they hoped, I should say, that when they saw these things, they would say, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy, right? It's very interesting because they used to take things that if they put those same things in front of us and we took those things to, Inshallah, this is a good sign, people probably would laugh at you, right? <laughs> but when you find the Prophet used to do the same thing, right? So in the, uh, you know, the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah, you know that the, when the Muslims were going to attack uh, Mecca and they were going to take back Mecca, there was a peace treaty that took place and delayed this by uh, a number of years, right? And in that, of course, that was a very difficult time for the Muslims, right? Um, and there was a number of conditions in that peace treaty and things of that nature. But it's interesting. Hadith says that in that when they were going to come and sit down and write that peace treaty, there was supposed to be a representative from, of course, the Muslims and then a representative from uh, the Kuffar of Mecca as well. Hadith says that when the Prophet heard the name of the person who was the representative of the Kuffar, his name was Suhail ibn Amr. Okay. What did the Prophet say when he heard the name Suhail? He said, Insha'Allah. He said, hopefully things have become easy for you. Why? Because the name Suhail comes from the root word of Sahl, which means easy right, and comfort, comfortable, basically. So this is something that the, the Prophet takes and he says, Inshallah, it's going to be like this. If we did this, people might actually laugh at us. right? But you see that the Prophet used to do this. And in Islam, we are taught that if you do this, it's not just a matter of having hope. It's not just a matter of uh, having positive mentality. No, there's actually a real time correlation between you uh, hoping good things to happen and them actually happening. Right. Like These are things that motivational speakers talk about quite a bit. In Islam, we also have this, but in a more uh, structured and a more rooted manner. Right? Hadith says, Tafa'alu bil khair tajidu. If you sit there and say, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to help me, tajidu, you will find that He will help you. Right? So there's a real life, real time correlation between these two. It's not just a matter of just have the right mentality, have a positive mentality. No, it's not like that. It's, it's more uh, deeply rooted in life than that. Right? So this is on the good side. On the bad side, for those who take certain things that happen as bad luck. Now, it might be certain things that happen in life and people take it as bad luck, or it might just be people who start to have multiple doubts and they think to themselves that, you know what? I think that this is not going to work out. I don't think this is going to go through. I don't think this is going to help, right? Th those types of thoughts, uh, of thoughts. Um, this has been something that Islam has definitely challenged very aggressively, right? Hadith says, At-tiyaratu shirkun. Tiyara is a form of shirk. Of course, it's not the shirk that, you know, the, the formal fiqhi shirk that we're talking about. It's not that, right? It means that you are underestimating God's uh, presence and his His character and his, his, his power, basically. Right? That's what you're doing, right? I want to move on to this hadith, a couple hadiths I want to share uh, about this. They're very beautiful. First one is from Imam Sadiq. This is for those who always have these thoughts that come into their mind, right? Especially when you want to make a big decision. Uh, we have to talk about that in just a second. Sometimes, like, like we say in English, sometimes you have cold feet or you get cold feet. We'll talk about that in just a second. 
The sixth Imam said, "At-tiyaratu ala ma taj'aluha." These thoughts, this idea of bad luck, all of it depends on how you deal with it, the way you are going to uh, mold it, basically. He said this. He says, "In hawantaha tahawanat." If you make it as if it's not a real thing, then it won't be a real thing, right? Wa in shadattaha tashaddadat. But if you emphasize it, then it will become a real thing, right? Wa in lam tajanha shay'an lam takun shay'an. And if you don't even consider it as something that exists, it won't even be something to begin with, right? So these shows that this is a real life correlation between there's a cause and effect real uh, correlation between our thought process and what happens in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives right i want to share this hadith also uh, this one is from the prophet this one is very beautiful he says thalathun la yaslamu minha ahadu. there are three things that no one can run away from like there's no one who's immune from these three things right number one Number one is the idea of you looking at different situations and you having thoughts of bad luck. Like, oh, this is not going to work out. This is going to run into problems. It's going to have issues. That's number one. Number two, wal hasad. You see someone much more successful than you, you might feel jealous. Okay, that's number two. And number three, wal then, right? When you feel like you have a wrong assumption about someone or a negative assumption about someone right he says thalathun la yaslamu minha ahad these three things everyone is going to be dealing with them okay so does that mean that i'm just okay and like you know that happens okay i'm jealous so what <laughs> is that is that what the hadith is saying no the hadith continues right very beautiful hadith he says qila famanasna uh, so someone was there they said well what are we supposed to do right like we have these three you're saying no one there's no one on the face of earth that can like that isn't going to deal with these three so what are we supposed to do قال, فمضي, when you have tiara when you have these ideas of bad luck things aren't going to work out i don't know if it's going to go through i don't know this i don't know that فمضي, move forward with your decision right just go ahead do it don't sit there and contemplate for hours and hours. Of course, contemplation has its own part. Once you reach a decision and you feel confident in that decision, then that's it. You move forward with it, right? When you have hasad towards someone, do not follow up on that hasad. What does that mean? That means don't allow this hasad go from a point where it's only in your mind for it to reach a point where it actually shows up in your actions. Don't do anything against that person. You might feel a little hasad at the beginning. You might, it might be something that just crosses your mind at one point, right? يبغي, it means to follow up on something, to look for something, right? It means don't allow this to move into the realm of action, right? Don't act up, act on it, as they say. Number three, and when you have negative assumptions about somebody, you have su'idhan, uh, I don't know if it might be tuhaqiq or fala tahaqqaq, right? When you have su'idhan, don't let it become a thing. Move on from it, right? Ignore it, basically. Right? Now, it's interesting. Each one of these topics has its own uh, discussion. From this, brothers and sisters, one thing that we can understand is this, that the Quran is teaching us that this idea of tiara, it's not really something that is based in truth and in reality. What does this relate to? This relates to brothers and sisters a lot of times when we end up doing istikhara. This is something that we have to be very careful about. Istikhara has a particular time, it has a particular place. Many times people, they will think through a situation fully, right? They will come to a conclusion. They're like 90% sure that this is the way to go, right? Sometimes there are clear proofs for them that this is the decision to make. Yet they get cold feet. They assume that because they got cold feet, now they have to come and do what? They have to come and do istikhara. That's not necessarily how it works, right? If your doubt is 5 10%, listen, you're pretty sure. <laughs> What, what decision in life is it that you and I are making that we are 100% sure 
that it's the right move. I, I would challenge you to come up with 10 decisions in the past year that we made where we were 100% sure it was the right decision. No, usually you're 90%, 85% sure. That's how the intellect and the mind of the human being works, right? If you wanted to be 100% sure about everything, if you wanted to make big decisions and never get cold feet, right, then that you would never be making any decision at all. So when Issachara comes into the play, in, into the picture, when there's more of a, uh, a more serious doubt that we're dealing with, right? Not when we're just having cold feet. Right? Now, of course, this idea of cold having cold feet in this culture, they use it to talk about, you know, when, when marriage comes up and that kind of stuff. And that, that's something we don't believe in. If you went about marriage in the right method and in the right way, this idea of cold feet is a little... Um, something that shouldn't be there to that extent right? like we see in the movies and, and, and in the culture over here so i don't want to get into that right now but anyways istikhara comes up brothers and sisters when there is a major doubt in mind not if you're two percent doubt i mean when was the last time we made a decision where we were a hundred percent i can't remember any decision i made <clears throat> where i was a hundred percent sure that this is the right move and yet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us intellect so that means when you feel confident about a decision, then you move forward with it. As the Prophet said, when you have these doubts, you move on with it and you live with the results, as they say, right? Yes, if you have a 50-50 doubt, yes, that's a situation where you think about it and you consult others. And if it doesn't work and you're still stuck, then istikhara is a place, that's a place where you would uh, end up doing istikhara. Moving on, so this is this is what they said. Inna tatayarna bikum. Next verse is even more beautiful. Qalu ta'irukum ma'akum. They didn't say, no, 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 we don't believe in tiara. They said, listen, you have your tiara with you. What are they trying to say? What are these prophets trying to say? Your bad luck is with you. They're saying, listen, if you guys disobey God, obviously you're going to have bad luck. Duh, <laughs> of course you're going to have bad luck. And this is something, brothers and sisters, that people don't realize, they don't recognize. That if you do haram, if I do haram, and I don't repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course I'm going to have bad luck. Of course. There's no doubt about that, right? Again, this is not bad luck with that connotation that denotes that there's no main power moving everything around. No, it's bad luck in the sense that that main power is going to have issues with you. Right, and the best example for this is the story of Prophet Musa. You don't think Fir'aun had bad luck? He had bad luck, didn't he? Have bad luck. He chose one baby out of the thousands of babies that Bani Israel had, one baby boy, and that one baby boy that lived out of the thousands of baby boys ended up what? Taking over his whole his whole kingdom and everything, and ruining everything for him. Of course, he had bad luck. And this is what these prophets are saying. Yes, if you disobey God, problems are going to happen. And that's something you find, I don't know how much, of, how much of it is prevalent here, but in some cultures it's very prevalent. People going through difficulties and sometimes they blame it on jinn, sometimes they blame it on magic, on black magic, witchcraft and stuff like that. And of course that has its own discussion. But my point is, first thing you're supposed to check is, am I doing haram in my day-to-day -day life? If yes, then there you go, that's, you have the answer to your question, that's where it, that's where it lies. If I'm doing haram and I'm not doing tawbah from it, of course I'm going to have bad luck uh, in, my, uh, in my life. Right? So this is what these prophets are saying. Your luck is with you guys. It all depends on you. You guys are musrifun. You guys are transgressors. And then you say, oh, we're having bad luck. You guys are the, the means of our bad luck. No, your luck has to do with the type of person you are. Right? Moving on from that. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْسَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى I'll mention this verse and inshallah we'll end. In case anyone has any questions, you can send it in now. And we'll take a look at the questions inshallah. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْسَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And from the outside of the city, or the furthest part of the city, came this one man, يَسْعَى. He was in a rush, right? As if he was running. He turned to these people, he said, no, listen to these messengers. Okay, first question that we're supposed to ask is, who is this mysterious character? It's jumping into the story in the middle of the story that's taking place, right? This 
has happened in this story, also in the story of Prophet Musa, there's a guy that shows up in the middle of the story, right? And over there, he's called Mu'mina Ali Fir'aun, right? Suratul Ghafir is also referred to as Suratul Mu'min, which refers to this guy, because the conversation he had with the people of Fir'aun, all of it is mentioned, as far as I can remember, at least most of it, is mentioned in Suratul Ghafir, okay? Uh, that's the, the words of Mu'mina Ali Fir'aun. This guy is showing up, he's doing something very similar, right? He's saying, listen to these prophets. Who was this person? History says that this was a person by the name of Habib and that he was a carpenter. That's just as far as we know. We're not 100% sure about it. This is history. So we can't swear on these details, basically. But what was the role that he played? He was playing the role of a person who comes and takes the words of these messengers and explains them a little bit better, right? Not a little bit better because the prophets can't explain things good enough because he's one of them. And because he's one of them, they take less offense if he comes and he says things, right? He comes, first argument he makes, Listen, man, follow those, these people who are not asking for any financial help from you. That's his first argument, which actually makes a lot of sense. Listen, if these people were after their own thing, they would be asking for some financial benefits, but they're not asking for anything. If they're not asking for anything, they're putting their lives on the line, right? It means that these people are either, right? this is not in the verse, and this is just my uh, explanation. They're either really, really good people that really believe in their, you know, in their uh, message and in, in their content or whatever it is that they're delivering, or they're crazy, right? It's one, it's one of these two, right? If you really think about it. And if these guys aren't crazy, right, and they're doing these miracles that you guys, well, then they really believe in this message. And therefore, you should really believe in it as well. Okay, so that's one argument he makes. Number two, Why shouldn't I believe and worship the one who created for me from nothing? When I was nothing, he brought me into existence. Of course, I should worship him. Right? These guys are telling you about a fatir. Fatir means someone who brings uh, something into existence from nothingness or non-existence, right? You know that when we create things as human beings, all we do is we take material that's there, we change the form, right? We add a couple buttons here and there, and it turns into whatever it is that we're we're creating, right? Even with cloning, for example, we what do we do? We take this uh, th these these uh, living um, creatures that are there, and then we change the settings here and there, right? We mold them in a way that they turn into what we want them to be. But we don't, as human beings, we can never bring something into existence from non-existence. Fatara means when something isn't there and you bring it into existence. That was his second argument. Third argument, and with this, inshallah, and end. Am I really supposed to sit here and take some other gods as my God when I know that their God or the main God or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he were to uh, basically send a punishment my way, that these gods would not be able to do anything, right? They wouldn't be able to stand in this in his path. They wouldn't be able to stop him from doing it. And as verses of the Quran say, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that if you if he wants to hurt somebody, you can't stop him. And if he wants to give mercy to somebody, you can't stop that either. This is basically the third argument of Habib al Najjar, or this car carpenter, right? If I do this, that I take other lords instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I'm clearly lost. Inni amantu, I'm moving on a little bit faster before we end so that we can start, inshallah, uh, from uh, verse 28, inshallah. Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon. This is, reaches a point where he says, listen, I believe in this and I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to me. And then the next verse says this, Qilat khul al jannah. What happened? We know that this person became shaheed. They killed him. And because they killed him, immediately he was told 
enter into heaven. Which heaven is this, brothers and sisters? This is not the heaven and hell that we read of on Yom Al-Qiyamah. This is the heaven of Barzakh. But the beautiful thing is this, even as this guy was going into Barzakh, because we know Barzakh is a mini heaven or a mini hell for us human beings until Yom Al-Qiyamah starts actually, right? He said, as he was entering into this mini heaven for him, قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ This is very beautiful. He says, I wish my people knew, right? As the Prophet has hadith here, he says, إِنَّهُ نَسَحَ لَهُمْ فِي حَيَاتِهِ وَبَعْدَ مَوْتِهِ <laughs> This Habib al Najjar, he was looking after his people, he was trying to guide his people while he was alive, even after he had left this world. Still, his heart was beating for these people. He said, قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ I wish my people would know. What? بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ I wish my people would know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with me and how he made me one of those who are honored. In the sense that if they, they don't understand that if they just fix things, they will also be amongst those people who are honored. Verse 28 and 29, very beautiful verses. وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ مِنْ جُنْدٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّا مُنْزِلِينَ When this person was killed, we did not send anyone down upon this group of people. We didn't send an army. What is this verse saying? I remember listening to this verse like 20 different times and not understanding what is meant by it. Of course, you understand the translation, but what is meant by it? إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا سَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ Inshallah, next session, we'll talk about this. What is the Qur'an trying to say? We didn't send down any army for these people. What is, what is the message behind uh, this verse? Okay, so we'll end there, uh, Inshallah. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, brothers and sisters, for uh, being with us. Uh, inshallah, Shaykh Amin. We'll be with you guys tomorrow with his session. It starts uh, just around uh, 5 p.m. as usual. And uh, in case anyone is watching this after and you have questions, you can always inbox us and uh, we'll be happy to take a look at the questions as well. Thank you very much. We'll see you inshallah in the next session. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.